Hey, sup? How's it going? Been a while, huh? As you can see, this is the second part of a series that I'm working on, and if you haven't already watched the first part, get nice and comfy and go waste an hour of your time. But for everyone else, there is no point in dicking around, so let's just get straight back into it. So episode 3 begins and it's a slight improvement from what we've covered so far. However, the problem still is that there is nothing particularly enthralling about it. Yennefer's plotline continues on from the last episode, following her life at magic school. Where the show skips about 4 years ahead from the end of the last episode, where Yen is now about to graduate, and thankfully so, because her section this episode still inhabits many of the same problems as the previous episode, in that it's really fucking boring. Again, all of this stems from what I discussed in the last part, in that none of this backstory story is compelling or necessary, and it feels tedious to watch it all unfold. There is something I do have to mention though, because for whatever reason, and I don't know why they did this, the first thing we see when we get to the end section of this episode is a almost full minute of hunchback cuckold porn. Yes, we get to watch a minute of Yen and her boyfriend go to Pound Town, while a bunch of magical holograms of white people watch them the entire time, and subsequently start clapping the moment he goos inside her. Stop this! There was no reason for this, there was nothing gained from this, and what is meant to be communicated here could have been done in a hundred different ways. This was inserted in here because this was someone's fetish. Attention Freddy Fazbear's pizza customers. There's a mixed race couple kissing at table four. Now, while a lot of this stuff for Yen's section is boring and strange, to put it delicately. There is some interesting stuff regarding this Mages Council, referred to as the Brotherhood of Sorcerers, otherwise known as the WMF, where Fuckhead makes his appearance again, and where we get this scene that basically tells us that a majority of these magic losers shouldn't be trusted, because they assign their apprentices as advisors to the continent's kingdoms, but basically puppeteer them to influence their rulers to their own liking. But a lot of the stuff here is only interesting in terms of ideas, because none of this is ever really explored meaningfully, it really doesn't go anywhere, at least for this season, and will only show up or be mentioned in a handful of other scenes. Also, I'm really not compelled by any of this infighting between these people, because none of these characters involved are remotely intriguing or even entertaining. I really couldn't care less about cold bitch and one dimensional asshole fighting over stupid shit. The only real thing of note here is that since they learn that Yen has gross knife ear blood, they're assigning her as Nilfgaard's advisor because her originally assigned kingdom is best buds with Sintra, which as we know has a firm no elf policy. Yen is very upset by this because at this point storyline wise Nilfgaard is a shithole that barely functions and no one wants to deal with that. Because she's so pissed by this she ends up missing magic graduation, where everyone gets to alter their bodies to their own liking, which is a dumb change that I'll get into, and furthermore because her boyfriend was snitching to fuckhead they end up breaking up, surprise surprise, and she has a bit of a cry. She then goes to the guy that changes everyone's bodies, and she demands to be changed as well, but warns her very clearly that this will result in her being rendered infertile, which she accepts. To be reborn, you will bear no more. Do you understand? Now, this is a very important moment for Yen, because this event will be a large part of her character motivations and arc for this season, which is that she is very pissed off about not being able to have children and will go about extreme means to reverse this outcome. This is similar to the books, and it's a motivation that I actually like, mainly because a key part of Yennefer's character is her motherly relationship with Ciri, and it's probably one of her most redeeming aspects. Her being stripped of her fertility left her very bitter over the fact, as unsurprisingly, she felt that she had lost something that was extremely precious and valuable, which added a decent amount of complexity to her character. And because of that fact, you would also completely understand why she would form such a strong motherly bond with Ciri, and you would also completely understand why she would go to practically any length to ensure that she was safe. Not only because she considered her as her daughter, but because she may never be able to have that kind of relationship ever again. Now, in terms of her trying to gain back her fertility, the show does something similar, but once again does it in a much worse way. To begin with, a key difference is that this whole ripping out the uterus thing to make you look not fuck ugly anymore is not at all the case in the games and the books. In the books, Yen's infertility is mostly a side effect of using magical powers, which she was very likely unaware of when she started doing magic. Even if she didn't lose it, her teacher wanted mages to be sterilized when they were taught at magic school, so she really didn't have much choice in the matter. I think this works a lot better because I really like the idea of there being consequences for gaining such immense power, and it made Yen 
Anne's character more tragic because she was never given a chance to be a mother, so her gaining back that chance with Ciri made it have that much more of an impact. But the show here states that infertility is not the result of magic, and as I showed earlier, this interpretation of Yen is given a choice on the matter, is made fully aware of said choice, and she accepts said choice. And subsequently, one of the reasons why her motivation to gain back her fertility kind of falls flat for the rest of the season is because she will be constantly bitching about how she was never given a choice, and how that the Brotherhood stole her choice despite knowing of said choice, how she continues to benefit from what she gained from her choice, and will be completely hypocritical when it comes to the choices of others. And this just kind of results in nothing but a lot of whiny victimhood and her not taking responsibility for her actions for the next four or so episodes. Funnily enough, there are some defences for this, and they come from a very predictable source. The main arguments I see in defence of this change is that given the position she was in, Yen never really had much of a choice to begin with, that she was young and immature, and she wanted some control over her decisions since she had been constantly stripped of her choices throughout her life. Okay. Now, I feel that the people that defend the show for these reasons more so like the ideas that this plot point introduces rather than how the show executes them, because there are some problems here. To begin, yes, I completely understand that someone young and naive would do something incredibly impulsive and stupid. That's not really what I have a problem with. Despite thinking that this you lose your womb if you alter your body shit is a lame change, I can understand making that choice because you are A, a dumbass, B, a woman, and C, are young and aren't thinking clearly. The issue the issue I have is that she never grows out of this mindset. We're about to hit some significant time skips for the upcoming episodes, and in those episodes her age ranges between the late 40s to the early 70s. Yet yeah, it seems like she has not matured or aged at all during that time as she still has the mindset of a petulant teenager whilst not moving on from what she is partially responsible for. I mentioned in the first part that Yen does have some progression over the course of the season, and while that is true, what I didn't mention is that with each episode she becomes more and more unlikable, and in a manner that I don't believe is well written. I'm sorry, but I don't find it very interesting hearing someone bitch and moan over stuff that they had some control over. It would have been fine if she just accepted some responsibility at some point, but she doesn't. Except for maybe one scene of self-reflection, but even then I would call that a stretch. And what makes this worse is that Yen is perfectly happy to complain about what she lost, but she will say absolutely nothing about what she gained. And what I mean by that is, through her gaining magic and her wanting to transform herself, she gained a huge number of opportunities that she would have never been able to have otherwise. But for her, that is not enough, because Yen does not regret losing her fertility because she felt that she had lost something important, she ends up regretting her choice merely because she wasn't satisfied with what she got, and she simply wants more from what she gained, and to do that means gaining back what she traded away. And the show kind of attempts to explore the idea that power and influence aren't enough to make you happy, but again, does it kind of in a shit way, because her woes are about her choice feel lacklustre, as the series never shows her as being unhappy with what she has gained from this choice, and never portrays it as a potential downside. And yes, while she is unhappy with her situation, and states it several times, it is not because of what she transformed into. She made a choice that she ends up regretting, but is never unhappy with the actual change itself. So it makes her bitching about her choice, again, fall flat, because she is actively using what she gained from the choice to benefit herself. And because of this fact, her desire in the show to get back her fertility, ironically enough, comes across as childish. In the books, Yen feels that she has lost something that is so simple yet so fundamental to human nature and does what she can to get that chance back. Whereas in the show, it more so comes across as a I want something that I can't have sort of mindset. It's just really tedious and quite honestly a disservice to the original character. And despite my praises just now, one that I'm not even that much of a fan of. Like I said, Yen in the books was pissed and bitter over the fact that she couldn't have children. Understandably so, because that is a huge thing to lose. But she dealt with it. She accepted what happened, even though she still tried to look for a potential cure, despite the fact that one existing was incredibly unlikely. Book Yen dealt with the situation in a more mature and interesting way, and the real kicker here is that this version would be more justified in acting like her show counterpart because she was not given a choice. A simple fix for this would just be to follow what the books did. Have Yen's teacher say to her students, Yo, by doing magic there is likely going to be a 90% chance that you will be as barren as this desert in episode 4, and even if you aren't, I find children fucking disgusting, and I think they're a distraction from your magical responsibilities. So I'm taking those eggs, ladies. I don't know why I'm telling you this, because frankly, you don't have a choice in the matter. Or just say that this line is complete bullshit, that her eggs don't need to be removed in order to get transformed, and this is simply used
used as a way for them to control her further. Boom, that's all you needed to do in order to make Yen's character in the show work a lot better. So basically, to sum up real quick, the version of the character who is more justified in being upset with the situation deals with it in a much more mature way, yet the version that is given more freedom over her choice is less justified in the way that she deals with the situation. Now, I believe that the show has done this because they want to give Yen something of an empowerment arc, where she is defined by her own choices and not by the choices of others. And it seems like they're trying to provide some commentary on the nature of choice and consent, and if that is the case, they have completely dropped the ball because Yen, throughout all of this, is a complete hypocrite. I am jumping ahead here, but I do need to highlight this, because Yen in the show, for all her bitching about having a choice, does not give a shit about consent. Throughout the season, she does the following. Forces a man into changing her appearance by threatening to cut off his dick and balls, gropes Yasuki's dick and balls while holding a knife to his neck, brainwashes the mayor of the town she lives in later on, turning him into a slave, but I guess since he's a dickhead, that doesn't count, brainwashes dozens of people into having an orgy with each other, for whatever reason, then says a code phrase that makes them stop, where they immediately start freaking out over it. And finally, brainwashes Geralt into attacking people that have personally slighted her in this town, resulting in him being put in jail and likely to be executed. She had you enact revenge on her behalf. The sentence would be passed by the very council members you attacked. It is sure to be death. That's five instances of her giving fuck all to what people have to say about their choices, possibly more, but the moment her choice is taken away from her, she has a meltdown. Now this leads to another defense of the show, saying that you're not meant to find Yen particularly likable, similar to how she was written in the books early on. Well, you better tell that to some of the people on Reddit, as well as journos, because they seem to disagree. In Netflix's The Witcher series, Yennefer of Vengerberg is the greatest hero of them all, and the true protagonist of the first season's journey. It is sure to be death. Also, the person who wrote this very much gave a charitable reading of Yen's character because despite her constant bitching about the system, she will do nothing about said system. A majority of her actions throughout the entirety of the season are for purely selfish reasons, and whenever her actions do help the underdog, it's more so a side effect from a situation she still benefits from. And yes, while she is not a great person in the books, she is one, not a hypocrite or at least self-aware when being one, and two, the books do not pretend to show her as a completely more upstanding person, particularly early on. And let it be known, her being a shitty person is not the problem. There are movies that I think are fucking great that have characters that do shitty things, while being able to understand and sympathise with them despite them doing those shitty things. The difference is in the writing, because the show goes out of its way to try and make you like and sympathise with Yen wherever possible, go on about how she's super important and powerful. The chapter thinks you're rash, unpredictable and dangerous. But right now, that's exactly what to say and I need. And minimalizes, ignores, and even justifies some of the shitty things about her. And whenever people call her out on her bullshit, it's portrayed as if those people are in the wrong, or she just outright ignores what they say and continues to be a shitty person and play the victim. And what makes this even more baffling is that the showrunner herself has stated that Yennefer is culpable for her own actions, and that she is not a victim. But then Yen goes on to say shit like this. A child? What could you possibly want with a child? They took my choice. I want it back. So, which is it? Because the material that you are presenting directly contradicts with what you are saying in this interview. Now, this is not me running defense for mage scum. Quite no, honestly, we haven't burnt enough of them. Enough. Hell, I'm not even absolving them of partial blame, but I just don't find this pity party for Yen to be that compelling nor justified. And this just later results in nothing but badly written melodrama where it just seems that Yen refuses to take any sort of responsibility for her actions. But hey, what woman does. Anyway, we get Yen's transformation scene, which I will admit is decently effective in how off-putting it is. With her newly acquired form, she goes to this magical ballroom and starts making fuck me eyes towards the king of her originally assigned kingdom, getting a one-way ticket out of Shitsville. And that's the end of her section for this episode. 
Now moving on to Geralt's section, the storyline for him this episode is based on the first story within the first book, simply titled The Witcher. The story as a whole is fine. It works well in establishing who Geralt is as a character and what a Witcher actually does. The plot follows him going to a northern kingdom known as Temeria, where he is contracted by its ruler King Foltest, a extremely vocal voice and supporter of the Windcest movement, to investigate, find, and cure a monster, killing it if he has to, which turns out to be the offspring created by the opponent of said Wincest. The show kinda follows the short story's basic plot, but once again there are a decent number of changes, and once again most are to its detriment. To begin the praises initially, I feel that this episode does a better job of conveying prejudices towards witches than episode 1 does, which was kind of dumb. As I mentioned, a monster is going around and killing people, as they do, and one of those victims ends up being the son of a miner, so he and his friends chip in to hire a witcher to hunt down and kill the monster. While trying to track it down, the Witcher ends up dying, but the miners aren't aware of that because the king is covering it up for whatever reason. That part of this situation is a dumb and unnecessary change, but I'll get to it. So instead of thinking that this Witcher is dead, they actually think that he completely fucked them over, stealing their hard earned coin and kind of not ensuring that them and their families are safe. Which makes them not too impressed when Geralt shows up and starts flopping around his 30 incher. Another fucking Witcher! <laughs> Your kind already swindled us once. The reason why I think this is a much better way to show how and why certain people aren't too ecstatic about witches being around, is that while they're not completely justified when it comes to their apprehension towards Geralt, you can understand their perspective as to why that is the case, especially when one of them has lost someone incredibly important to them. They are clearly not going to be in the right headspace when it comes to those like Geralt since they've already been fucked over by someone like him, and especially when their lives and the lives of their families are at risk. Again, not that the show is saying that they're right, but more so that their perspective is completely understandable in regards to what they think the actual situation is. This is a very, very minor instance of that, but I think it works well. I really wish the show did more stuff like this because it comes off as way more believable and seemingly has more thought put into it than Let's Lynch Whitey, who we can automatically detect is a witcher for some reason for simply walking into my establishment. So as these gentlemen are on the verge of revolt against the king, Geralt shows up and is able to provide a more reasonable offer to them. But before he can establish a lucrative transaction, the King's Guards arrive who basically tell all the miners to get lost, and essentially tell Geralt to fuck off because the King doesn't want the monster killed or to be fucked with. As he's escorted out of the country, he ends up meeting fan favourite character Triss, who is looking a little bit different than her book or game counterpart, but I'm struggling to find the best word that describes this change. Definitely an inward. Oh boy, it seems like we've reached that point, haven't we? So if it wasn't already kind of obvious, the show has decided to take some colourful choices when it comes to the casting of certain characters, and I think they're kind of odd choices, to say the least. Now aside from this being another example of another redhead having their skin darkened by a few shades, there are some issues I have with choices like these. Well, issues would be the wrong term for it, because frankly, I really don't care that much. I am not frothing at the mouth at the mere sight of a black person. Person. I am merely commenting on this because it's interesting to point out, and also how it's kind of stupid and funny to laugh at. First things first, I think part of the reason for these changes to characters' races comes from the brain-dead idea that the series itself is racist because it has a predominantly white cast. Ignoring the fact that this is likely due to the setting itself being reflective of Polish history, culture, and most of its population being white, I don't like this argument because I feel like the people making it either didn't play the games or read the books, are completely ignorant or retarded or are being purposely disingenuous. Hmm, it's almost like a major subtext of the books and the games is the discussion of racism and racial conflict and how it's kinda not the best thing. It's almost as if the main character of the series is a constant victim of prejudice. Hmm. On top of all that, other races in the franchise exist, such as the Ophiri, a race of people whose aesthetic and culture are based around countries within the Middle East, and the show has people from a country known as Zerokania, whose descriptions are more based on African and Arabic nations. In fact, their inclusion in the show is fine because it's not just an unnecessary change and it follows a sense of logic as to why they're there. There is also a forest filled with brown women, which I don't understand why they're there, but sure, by all means. 
Having these races and cultures exist is perfectly fine, in fact they add to the series universe. The continent, the main landmass where the story takes place, is designed to resemble Europe, whereas nations such as Ophir and Zeracania resemble countries in the Middle East and Africa. Though very broadly, as none of the nations in the series are meant to be a one-for-one -one recreation. So having all these places, consisting of different values and cultures, makes the setting richer with detail, as it presents it as a living and thriving world. So that's not really the issue here, the key problem I have is what is the point in changing how characters look if you don't do anything with it. Aside from altering her hair and skin colour, there is very little that changes with this character. Her personality seems the same, her general background seems the same, so what was the point? Surely if you're going to make a drastic change to a character's appearance there has to be some purpose behind it. This example doesn't just work for Triss, but other characters who have had their complexion slightly altered here and there, yet aside from that, little changes about them. If there was an inherent reason for these changes, I could at least understand what they were trying to go for, but I really don't because I don't see the point. In trying to understand the thought process behind this, I looked up what the showrunner Lauren Hissrich had to say on Twitter, and it was interesting. To boil down what she said, they basically had to adapt for several countries, and because America has treated non-whites like shit in the past, and because it's being made with an American frame of mind, they allegedly hired whoever was the best actor for the role. Okay Lauren, there is something that I need to point out to you here and the entire audience actually, so this is going to be a learning opportunity because I don't think a lot of people know this, but America isn't Poland. Now within the next 20 years or so that might be a different story, but you can't just apply American history and perspective into a show that is based on Polish culture, where the history surrounding race there is not the same as the history surrounding race in America. That's stupid. And no, we're not getting into the history of racism in the US and Poland. That is a topic that is too lengthy to get into, nor do I have the patience or intelligence to get into. No one wants to see that in a fucking YouTube review of a subpar Netflix show. By the way, even if Slavic culture is not synonymous with whiteness, as you say, the show does not at all capture the Slavic spirit that you mention here. In fact, the mood, tone, pacing and atmosphere of the show is fairly similar to other fantasy shows produced within the US. If I knew nothing about the series outside of the show, I would not have believed that it was based on a Polish property. Gee, I wonder why. Also, it's interesting how since you were going for the best actors for the roles, we don't see many Latinos, Asians or Native Americans when it comes to casting. I guess everyone from those demographics who came for auditions were just shit at acting or something. They're crap. 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 Mega crap. Also, pray tell, what other changes were made in order to accommodate the 190 countries that you are so proudly talking about here? Was the hunchback porn made for the Brits or something? That is bloody lovely! Though if you were to make that argument, it would be more believable than this nonsense. All of this reads to me as a haphazard defense in order for her to cope with the fact that she made dumb changes no one liked. In my opinion, she should have just stuck to her guns and made even dumber changes. I would have honestly respected her a lot more if she, and I'm dead serious about this, made Geralt black. Sorry about the up yours. Honestly, that would have been kind of great in a ridiculous way. You should have literally turned the series into the Witcher equivalent of Black Dynamite. It would be incredibly stupid, yes, but it would make the series that much more entertaining. So, my point here is that there is no purpose in changing these characters' races, and using American history as an excuse for it in this Polish fantasy world is an incredibly shit way to defend yourself. Also, to those praising this decision, well done, you were essentially congratulating the corporate equivalent of filling in the colours of a children's drawing book. But by all means, please ignore what I just said and call me whatever ist or phobe to your liking, because absolutely, that's definitely it. Also, this is a no way or shape confirmed, but something that needs to be noted here is that Triss went to the same school of training as Yen did, meaning that at some point she also got to change her body as well. Now, I'm not saying that this is true, but there is the slight possibility that Triss may have originally looked like her book and game counterpart, but simply decided to change her appearance to make herself look a little different. Again, there is no way to confirm this, but even the slightest chance of this being the case is incredibly hilarious to me. Regardless, having Triss be introduced here rather than her actual appearance in the books is a fine change, mainly because it really doesn't affect the core themes or storyline that much, and considering she ends up working for Foltis later on, it works well enough. Anyway, Geralt and Rachel Dolezal end up discussing the monster attack, where they figure out that it is a being referred to as a Striga, which is essentially a human that has been cursed. A lot of this is in the short story, which again, 
I felt was a good way to allow the audience to get a general idea of who Geralt is and what his profession is. So far in this section of the episode, there is nothing terrible, but nothing about this stands out either, so this just results in the episode being fairly dull. And this is just made further evident when Geralt and Blackface speak with Foltest, who in the books and the games actually had a personality, yet here he's this greasy old manlet who has a boring gruff voice. One man will kill you. Witcher. Though, at least, he has the more accurate appearance of a man who enjoys bum-tumbling his sister. Furthermore, I think Foltest here serves as the perfect example to a prevalent issue that I've mentioned with the series thus far, and that is its lack of personality. Foltest in this adaptation says nor does anything interesting, he just kind of sits or stands around waiting for someone else to do something so the plot can continue. The same goes for Triss, but to a lesser degree. Adding on to that, I had already mentioned about how Geralt's sections in episodes 1 and 2 cut out a decent chunk of material that made those stories more interesting, and this episode suffers the same fate. And because of this, it makes the show just an absolute chore to watch. What made the books and games good in terms of writing was that the characters felt like they had some agency to them as opposed to just sitting around and doing fuck all. They had interesting perspectives, goals, and mindsets that at times clashed with one another. The characters felt more believable rather than just stand-ins, and that was helped in part because they had, for the most part, good dialogue. While the dialogue in the show isn't terrible, it's very run-of-the-mill. There is nothing about it that really stands out that much. Coupled with how desaturated the visuals look, which adds to the show's lack of personality, results in the entire production looking and reading like some generic gritty fantasy show, which was the impression that I got from its promotional material. And it's kind of a shame because yeah, it is a gritty fantasy universe, but it felt unique in its own way. There was actually a lot of interesting stuff to the world that are both in the books and the games, and you can actually visit locations that aren't just varying shades of grey colours. And it just kind of sucks because the series is filled with some cool stuff, and I just don't think that this show explores it as well as it should have. Granted, there are definitely moments throughout the franchise that are completely stupid and just plain silly, but I feel like that added to the charm of it. I appreciated that despite how mature certain elements of this series got, there were moments of brevity and it wasn't a shame to be silly sometimes. Not to say that the show doesn't do that, but it is never as charming as Geralt trying to get information out of this lovable retard. Don't get bored down here. Not much to do. When bad, not much do. But think lots. What about, if you don't mind my asking? Rocks. Rocks. Rocks interesting. It's just really lame that so much of this show feels like it was made by corporate suits at Netflix rather than people who had an interesting vision on how to adapt this franchise. Regardless, Foltest in this is very boring and is very content not doing anything with the monster and not having Geralt get involved. I understand that he doesn't want to put his child at risk, but the whole purpose of this nonsense is just to create unneeded conflict that does little except to merely pad the runtime. And unsurprisingly, yet again, this was handled much better in the book. In the book, Foltest was the one asking for people, Witcher or otherwise, to help cure his daughter. That would be the most preferable outcome, but he understood that if that wasn't at all possible, giving her a painless death would be the next best thing. He would be exceptionally pissed if that was the case, but he understood that it may need to be done. See, that to me makes for a much more interesting dilemma where you understand where he is coming from. That he is clearly someone who absolutely loves and cares about his family, perhaps a little too much for my liking, but at the same time you understand that he has duties as a leader he needs to fulfill. And in order to do that, sometimes sacrifices have to be made, not only for the benefit of his people, but also to the benefit of his daughter who was suffering. Whereas here, he's content with maintaining maintaining a nothing stance, except for covering up the death of a witcher, in which the purpose seems like not to further frighten people, yet it seems like a completely moot idea since they are still on the verge of revolt. There is nothing gained from covering this up because you are still doing nothing to solve the problem. This direction they've gone with this story and character leads to nothing interesting, and in fact makes the character worse because they present him as an ineffective leader who seems more interested in gulping down some chicken wings. And yet again, they've cut out interactions between him and Geralt that were interesting and made the story better. Aside from that, there really isn't much else of note to talk about regarding Geralt's section for this episode. There is nothing offensively wrong with the rest of it, but again, there is nothing that really stands out either. Geralt takes on the request despite being told to leave, he figures out who 
who was responsible behind the curse. Feltest decides to give him the go-ahead anyway to cure the girl, and this results in a fight between Geralt and the Striga. It's an alright fight, even though it looks a little awkward in a lot of places, and that's about it. He figures out the solution, which is to keep her out of her crypt for the night, and this ends up curing the girl, though he gets a chunk of neck removed for his troubles. All in all, that wraps up Geralt's plotline for this episode, which, once again, despite making very dumb changes and how it's just kind of boring overall, I will say it's an improvement over the previous episode as Geralt has a more significant presence this time around, though it's still not anything to write home about. Oh, so now this leads into series section, and buckle up everyone because this will probably take a while to get through. So her involvement in the episode consists of the following. Her hearing voices in her head, causing her to walk in a trance-like state to a forest ruled by black women, and her elf friend getting shot with an arrow. And that's her section done. Now you may be wondering what connects this scene to the rest of the episode, and the answer is nothing. It is astounding that the events that are currently happening bear only the most flimsiest of connections to one another. But whatever, there is nothing else to say about this other than it being stupid, so let's move on. So, episode 4 is, for the most part, more of the same as the previous episodes, yet is a prelude for things to come, as everything starts getting a little more stupid from this point onwards. We'll start with Yen's section again, which focuses on her now being an advisor to the Kingdom of Aedon, as she is currently escorting its queen and her small baby child to... some place I can't remember. Interesting enough, this is the first time at all in the series where we're given an actual understanding of how much time has passed, as Yen mentions that she has been serving as an advisor to the the kingdom for about 30 years. And what's funny about this scene is that this is the only instance where Yen has some self-reflection about how she kinda maybe sorta fucked up her life a little bit. I love that I traded everything to get my seat at court. I love that I believe that it would all be worth it. That instead I've gotten to spend the last three decades cleaning up stupid political messes. However, this is undercut by the fact that both the Queen and the show blow smoke up her ass and tell her that she's actually really cool and epic, and that the Queen has it so much worse. People look at you for who you are, not for what you can give them. You made the right choice giving all that nonsense up. Very nice. She also says a line about how her child views her, which seems to plant the seeds in Yen's mind for her upcoming plan, formerly known as Operation Egg Reclaimer. However, they're suddenly attacked by an assassin, Mr. Eyeliner McGee here, and whatever the fuck this thing is. What follows is kind of a fun chase sequence, or rather conceptually it's a really fun idea, but unfortunately is kind of underwhelming. It involves Yen opening a series of portals and hopping between locations in order to escape this assassin. The reason it's kind of underwhelming is because it really doesn't take the idea to its fullest, as it's not as exciting as it should be, and there really isn't a lot of tension. Similar to what I discussed beforehand, I'm not really concerned for Yennefer's safety here because she and Geralt haven't met yet, so it's pretty much a guarantee that she's gonna come out of this just fine. In something that was better written, the show itself could have deceived me into being concerned for her safety, but we all know that isn't the case. Plus, I really don't care about this Queen character because one, she has been on screen for like 5 minutes or so, and two, she is a selfish bitch who is willing to let her child die so she can try and escape. Also, something that undercuts this tension that they are trying to build here is that this thing seems like it's giving her much more trouble than it should be. This is evident when Yen basically freezes it in time, and she just doesn't do anything to it. This nigga's stuck. Stuck, stuck. Um, no, atomize that fucking thing, then worry about this dude coming after your ass. And the thing is, she kills it no problem later on, so it's not like she couldn't have done so earlier. I know that the purpose is so that they can have an exciting chase scene, but it's kinda hard to achieve that when the thing that is chasing after you could be easily disposed of with the fantasy equivalent of a 12 gauge. I have a shotgun. Haha, <laughs> let me prove it. And I really do wish I could find a positive in this show without there being some sort of catch to it, because every time I do, the show manages either to fuck it up somehow or present it in a half-baked way. Regardless, the queen ends up dead, and as Yennefer tries to save her baby, the child also ends up getting killed, which I'm not going to show because unlike Netflix, I'm not an enormous fan of seeing dead children. Though Yen at least has the decency to give the baby a proper burial, we then get this wonderful schizoid rant where she starts projecting onto this dead child about how her life sucks. I'm sorry you didn't have a life. Still, what would you have had? Parents? 
Well, they're the ones who wrote your last act. So not much lost there. Friends, most likely fair weather. Lovers, fun for a bit, I'll admit, but will eventually disappoint. And let's face it, you're a girl. We're just vessels. And even when we're told we're special, as I was, as you would have been, we're still just vessels. For them to take and take. Stop fucking crying, bitch! Where, where, where? I don't wanna fucking hear it! Yeah, real motherly attitude. Totally not playing the victim here, Lauren. Clearly not unhinged behavior. It truly does seem like this person wants to get back her fertility for not completely selfish and petty reasons. I think you can at least now understand why I'm not the biggest fan of this character. I'm not sure how you're supposed to view Yen now as anything other than an unhinged sociopath. I am beginning to see why her dad hated her so much. Get that ugly, disabled freak! away from me. Anyway, that is her part for this episode done. Overall, not that great. I'll say one last positive is that I do like the look of this cockroach thing, but that's about it. Moving on, Ciri's section is kind of a mess. She enters this sacred forest, which like I said, is ruled by brown women. It's pretty much a paradise for those who like to dabble in race mixing. A place she will be stuck in for two episodes, and not only is it boring as shit to watch, it's also ugly as sin to look at. For whatever reason, they felt the need to include these blinding as fuck lens flares that are almost in every single shot inside this forest. I don't know why they did this or what it's meant to convey, but regardless, it makes all of these scenes look like garbage because it results in this disgusting tint over all these shots. Think fast, chuckle nuts! <laughs> Siri tries lying to these women about who she is in order for them to give her a place to stay. They oblige, but they make her and her elf friend drink some magic water or some shit, which is basically meant to determine if they are here to cause trouble. If you have evil intent, then you basically die, but if you're a decent chap, then you're good to go. Knowing that she is about to be exposed, she tells her elf friend about who she really is. However, he then freaks out a bit and proceeds to start giving us some stock standard backstory about how his family was genocided by her grandmother. Soldiers, they lost when they did it. Killing, raping. They laughed the hardest when they were swinging babies from their legs, smashing their heads in. Who's the only one left? And Siri's response to this is I don't know what to say. And she will never say anything about this again. You'd think learning about this would actually lead to something meaningful for her character, but aside from it being brought up in a line later on, it's never explored meaningfully. Again, episode 2 did this as well, but that never went anywhere either. It's as if the show never wants her to confront the idea that perhaps her grandmother was kind of a cunt. Siri continues to act blanker than a fresh sheet of paper, so nothing that happens here is compelling in the slightest because neither the characters nor the plot develop meaningfully. Meaningfully. And once again, it's a slog to get through as it's just Siri sitting around for two episodes getting speeches from this one woman about her future. Other than that, there's not too much of note and her section ends with her drinking the magic water and having a weird psychedelic dream. Geralt's storyline in this episode is where things get a little silly and I don't mean that in a fun way, I mean that in I'm getting secondhand embarrassment by watching this kind of silly. The episode starts with Geralt returning from a monster hunt with Yaskia convincing him to join him at this royal party to as Geralt says, I'm protecting the bard from vengeful royal cuckolds. The party itself is located in Sintra, set about 14 years before you know. This happens, where Kalanthe is basically selling off Ciri's mother to marry the best suitor. And finally, halfway through the show, the storylines are now slowly beginning to intersect, though we're not quite there fully yet. During this little get together, Geralt meets up with Mousehack, yes, silly name, who I mentioned in the first part. He's an old friend of Geralt's, and the main reason I'm bringing him up here is because he is relevant to a point I'm going to be making towards the end of this episode, and he is important to the next two episodes where things are going to get really stupid. Anyway, given that Geralt is somewhat well known for killing women and allegedly elves, he is given a guest of honor status by Kalanthe, and over the course of several minutes we get scenes where she acts like an annoying drunk the majority of the time, where we get some brief lore dumps, and this scene where she starts mogging on this potential suitor from Nilfgaard. Sintra is indeed the jewel of the North. 
Yet Nilfgaard remains a shit rag of the South, and that's saying something. <laughs> hmm, curious, what happens again 14 years? Oh, that's right. Dude probably got the last laugh in the end. Also, if it seems like I'm skipping through a decent chunk of this, that is because I am, as there is really nothing interesting going on here, and there is only so many times that I can say that the show is boring. So as they're inspecting potential husband material, suddenly this masked intruder arrives, coming in as a last minute suitor. Now, brief autistic lore dump, but he invokes what is called the law of surprise, which pretty much means that if at some point you help someone, say save them from certain death for example, you can declare this law as a payment for the future as you're going to be asking for something that they have but are not yet aware of. This is important for later, sorry for the autism. Given that he saved the former king before he died, he has now decided to invoke the law, and honestly, the man was smart to play the long con, because now he basically gets a free kingdom for his troubles. The twist, however, is that this gentleman is actually a strange hedgehog man thing, and it literally took all of my energy when I first saw this dude not to burst out laughing. I know that the show wants me to take this scene seriously, given how they have framed it, as everyone is immediately freaking out or is on edge around this dude, with the accompanying music very much conveying that. The thing is though, I cannot. Now, this is likely a me problem, but I cannot for the life of me take a scene seriously where a hedgehog man is present. Maybe one day I will, but I get the impression that media involving Sonichu OCs won't be very prevalent for a while now, so who knows when that will happen. Now, I can't even fault the show too much for this, because this is an the book and while it worked better in that, it was still reasonably goofy. But I also think that this is something that works better in the written form as the weird hedgehog man's appearance is more interesting when you leave it more to one's imagination. In the show, the prosthetics that they have on him just make him look really silly and not believable in the slightest. But even then, I feel like no matter what they would have done, I doubt I would have been able to take it very seriously. So again, I'm not going to blame the show for that because it's probably a me issue. However, what I will blame them for is how the scene is paced and its piss poor characterization. So some of the reason that this worked better in the story was because this reveal was built up to. As the Nighthog and Calanthe had a back and forth that slowly revealed information and built up the tension of the situation. In the show, about less than a minute passes before the true nature of the man is revealed and another minute until a fight breaks out. A way lamer setup and payoff, which is caused, as I've already discussed, by how the show is paced and structured. Because they constantly have to keep switching to whatever Yen and Siri are doing, Geralt once again gets the shaft, and they just skim past or outright cut so many interactions in his sections that they just lack any sort of interesting moments. But no, clearly we needed to see the gross hunchback porn and Yen act like a schizoid for a good two minutes straight. It's just very frustrating that they cannot let the show breathe for a minute because either they lack the time or that they just think the audience might get bored or something so instead of any sort of build up it's just like nah he's a weird hedgehog man now enjoy epic fight scene. This then leads to what I mentioned about poor characterization compared to the book. Like I mentioned the back and forth between the two of them in the book not only revealed information about the situation but also gave some insights into their characters. In the story Kalanfe was presented as someone who was a lot more cunning than her show counterpart. She was very much aware that this widow might show up, and there are lines that very much confirmed that she had contingencies in place if he did show up. It presented her as a fairly calculated individual who was clearly protective of her daughter, obviously given that she does not want this dude anywhere near her. While the show version is also just as protective, she is nowhere near as intelligent as her book counterpart, as whenever she isn't acting like an annoying wine aunt, she is irrational and hyper-emotional. And yes, the book version was also hyper-emotional, but that was over the course of the conversation, as otherwise she remained composed and calm as she tried to manipulate the situation to her favour and get this freak away from her daughter. She kept trying to spring gotchas onto this dude but he was having none of it and had perfect counters for her, so she naturally got frustrated because of that. And it also showed that this dude was capable of holding his own intellectually and seemed a lot more cunning and calculated than he appeared as well. And given the events that happened later on in the series, it is very obvious that was the case. Clan Fei, like Foltis, behaves like a dumbass ruler who half the time acts impulsively, while the other half is her being an obnoxious drunk and complaining about stupid bullshit. Her incompetence is further evident in episode 7 and even in episode 1, where her husband is like, hey, Nilfgaard seems like it might be a bit of a problem, 
before blowing him off, then being immediately told that they are already in their territory. Also, it's a little bit interesting that this kingdom that has existed for centuries gets toppled and subjugated during the reign of a female ruler, but I'm sure that's just a funny little coincidence. Anyway, now that they can see all of the Hedgehog Man and that they've walked into his mystery, he tells them to step inside and hold on for dear life as he explains the benefits he can provide as a future son-in-law. This involves him going into vivid detail about how with his future wife they would be able to create an army of hedgehog human hybrids and with the right training would be capable of toppling foreign kingdoms within a matter of weeks. Kalanfe isn't really too impressed by this as she's not really a great fan of having an army of hedgehogs Skaven, so she orders Geralt to kill him. However Geralt, showing great interest in this new race of hedgehog people, says no so a fight breaks out. And this is a good as time as any to point out another major issue here similar to the one I had with Yennefer's section. The trouble comes from the fact that these characters are now here again and while it does establish some character traits and understanding of their personalities, as little as there is, the problem is why should I care? We all know how this is going to end so it's kinda hard to get invested in people who we know have a definite expiration date. Granted, this is an inherent problem you face when you are making stories that have flashbacks or are presented in non-linear ways. Yes, it can work in some cases, but you need to be skilled at it, and the show has demonstrated that it is incapable of doing so at the moment. So ultimately, this is just a bad choice because it makes the audience way less invested in what is going to happen to certain characters. This conflict worked much better in the short story because again, while the book was non-linear, the events of this story happened in the first book while their deaths happened in the second. Again, this may sound incredibly obvious and condescending, but this meant that since they introduced these characters before they died, it allowed the audience to gain an understanding of them, their personalities, and their importance. So when they eventually die, the potential impact that their deaths have is that much more fulfilling. Meaning that this very blatant, let this is so sad moment would have some weight to it as opposed to none at all. When you do it the opposite way, it's a lot harder to get invested in these characters and this story when you have a general understanding of how things will go. So when this big fight happens later in the episode, it fundamentally loses its intended impact because the show has lessened its stakes. It's just hard to care about a conflict when you know one way or another everything is going to be fine for the most part. I care little about this current predicament because there is no tension as to where it leads. Even if I wasn't aware of the source material, I would still have a vague understanding of what is going to happen given with all the scenes that we have been shown thus far. Furthermore, because of how much the show jumps around, I typically find it a lot more difficult to get invested in whatever is going on. Just because you can present your narrative in a non-linear way doesn't mean that you should. When it actually serves a purpose, whether it be thematically or narratively, you should absolutely do it. However, when you do it because you watched a movie that did something similar, the non-linear style comes across as a lot more gimmicky. Hi everyone, future me here. So I just stumbled upon a bit of an interesting development well after writing this part of the script and I am now adding this here to make a small clarification in regards to what I just said. So I recently discovered that in Poland, The Sword of Destiny, which is considered the second book in the series, was first published in 1992, whereas The Last Wish was published in 1993. Now this may seem like a pretty major fuck up on my end, however, something I further need to explain is that technically neither of these are the first book. The first original book was simply titled The Witcher which was released in 1990, which is now obsolete and only had a Polish print. And additionally, it contains a majority of the same stories that are in The Last Wish, one of them being the story this section of the episode is based on. Meaning that The Last Wish is still technically and considered officially the first book in the series, and my potential fuck up remains avoided. Even if that wasn't the case, every single website where you can buy or review the books always puts The Last Wish as first. Not to mention its original publisher, considering it the first first official book in the series, despite the difference in publication dates. So even if I did fuck up, which I didn't, I feel I would be somewhat justified in making that mistake. Not to mention the fact that it fundamentally does not make any sense to start with the Sword of Destiny over the Last Wish because the latter does a much better job of setting up the world and the events that happen later on. Now this may seem like a borderline pointless attempt to cover my ass, especially given as my arguments are still reasonably justified, however I am just pointing this out to let people know that I am aware of this weird publication situation. Also, as a defense in case some big brain decides to try and spring some kind of gotcha onto me. Regardless, the only thing that would change is that the first two books would just be as guilty as the show when it comes to presentation and escalation of events. 
Anyway, let's move on. Clownface stops the fight, where it is revealed that her daughter has been fucking this hedgehog man for about a year now. Not surprised in the least that a white woman was doing this. This then leads into a big long discussion about upholding traditions and laws, and also about one of the show's major themes, Destiny. Hold on to this, I will be coming back to it in a moment. Every major character here pretty much says that the hedgehog army is a really cool idea and she should uphold the law. When she asks for Geralt's opinion, he gives the most Reddit answer imaginable. Destiny helps people believe there's an order to this whole shit. There isn't. I am 99% sure that this is a quote made up for the show because not only could I not find it anywhere in the story, I could not find it in any of the books as well. While he does say something similar in the books, it is not written in such a way where it comes across as something an atheist would have hung up in his room as if it were an inspirational quote. Funny how they will cut out a billion and one interactions but they will leave this shit in. Also, in the event that this was in the books, it would still be a corny ass line. However, despite his redditism, he still thinks she should honour the deal. Calanthe, however, thinks that's highly homosexual and tries to kill the Hedgehog Man, which results in her daughter unleashing her white woman power, similar to Ceres. And this is the part of the episode that straight up gave me secondhand embarrassment, and it's really hard to explain why. I just feel watching these two people float up in midair while dramatic music is playing in the background, as the magic users fire their magic streams at them, just comes off as a tad too cheesy and weird for my liking. And don't get me wrong, I love corny and cheesy shit, but there was just something about the scene that just feels so incredibly lame that made it difficult to sit through. I don't know what exactly has set me off in regards to this scene, but I was more confused and embarrassed than compelled by watching it. At the very least, it gave me a different emotion other than boredom for a few minutes, so that's something I guess. Geralt and Malsack end up stopping whatever the fuck this is, and it leaves everyone a tad bit confused as to what the hell just happened. Clownfe then decides that mutated children are actually kinda epic, but then suddenly, for some reason or another, Hedgehog Boy turns back into a regular human, as whatever curse was afflicting him is now broken, and thus there disappears any hope of mutant world domination. Geralt is weirded out by this dumb shit and decides to bail. However, he is stopped by the former Hedgehog Man, and given that Geralt's just saved his life, he offers him anything in return. Geralt really doesn't care that much and just says he'll do the lore of surprise thing, same as him. And that results in this scene, which is played mostly to comedic effect, and I'll admit it got a small chuckle out of me mainly because of Henry Cavill's delivery. If I'm seen in your kingdom again, it will be to kill a real monster, not lay claim to a crop or a new pup. Destiny can go <coughs> Are you... <sighs> Fuck. Though I don't know how someone vomiting automatically leads to the assumption that that person is pregnant. As far as they know, using her white woman powers might have caused her to start spewing out her insides. After learning this, Geralt decides to double bail, which is another change from the book. In the story, it initially seemed like he was more than willing to use this law in order to gain a potential new Witcher. Something that had been both established in this episode and in the books was that Witchers were in short supply, and there wasn't a proper way to create them anymore. It is no longer possible to create more of us since the sacking of Gamoran. So he wanted to, at the very least, gain someone they could pass down their skills and knowledge to. However, this is kind of retconned later on as Geralt does not want anything to do with Ciri initially. So they mention that he declared the law on an impulse, or he wasn't thinking clearly, or something like that. Given that this was written early on, however the fuck you say his last name, likely didn't have everything super fleshed out yet, so this retcon was more so made to explore the larger story he wanted to tell. Which is fair, but it's also fair to acknowledge that a large a flaw of at least the short stories is that since not everything is fleshed out yet, this causes some contradictions to happen later on. I think Geralt flippantly declaring the lore works a bit better in that regard as it fits more with both the direction the books and the show follow. As Geralt tries to leave, Mousesack stops him, and then this leads back into the show's exploration of the idea of destiny. Destiny is a constant theme that is discussed and explored throughout the series, particularly in regards to Geralt and Ciri, as there is this reoccurring idea that the two of them were destined to meet and that their fates are inherently linked to one another. This is also a topic explored for a number of other avenues as well, but let's focus on this aspect of it because it is the most relevant. The general idea that the show follows is similar to the books, with Geralt rejecting this 
idea of destiny serving as a character arc that he undergoes. Initially, Geralt operates as an independent person who decides what he wants to do and does not want to be influenced by another source, regardless of who or what it is. He then steadily grows to realise that he can't escape this destiny and chooses to willingly embrace it, which is something the books explore as well. Two major problems with this theme, however. Numero uno is that you will know full well what the series' main theme is by the end of the season because the show will go out of its way to remind you of it wherever possible. Destiny. 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 Desti